This HIV update provides an overview of tuberculosis in HIV AIDS, presented by Dr. Beata Casañas. The activity planners do not have any financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose. The following speaker has financial relationships with the following commercial entities to disclose. Beata Casañas, Grant Research Support, VIVE, Consultant or Speakers Bureau, VIVE. This presenter will not discuss off-label use of investigational products during this presentation. This slide set has been peer-reviewed to ensure that there are no conflicts of interest represented in the presentation. Upon completion of this program, participants will be able to describe the epidemiology of tuberculosis, TB, in the United States and worldwide. Explain the difference between latent TB infection, LTBI, and active TB disease and how they are diagnosed. Illustrate the progression of latent TB infection into active TB disease. Describe the different treatment options for latent and active TB and formulate an empiric treatment plan for each disease state. Recognize the unique relationship between TB and HIV and how they accelerate the progression of each other and design an empiric treatment regimen for an HIV co-infected patient. The following statements relate to continuing medical education and continuing education. This session is approved for up to one hour of CECME. This enduring activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with the essential areas and policies of the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education through the joint sponsorship of the Florida AHEC Network and the Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center. In order to receive CE or CME credit, you must complete an evaluation survey which includes a request for CE CME. The evaluation survey link will be provided at the end of the video. When asked in the evaluation survey, indicate that CE CME is requested. You will then be directed to a survey that must be completed for our CE CME provider. The CE CME provider survey will include a post-test assessment. You must achieve at least a 70% in order to receive CE or CME. Participants will be able to print or save their certificates after successful completion of the post-assessment. Please note, if you received CE or CME credit for the live webinar that took place on May 12, 2015, you are not eligible to receive CE or CME credit for this on-demand module. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really uh, pleased to have everyone with us this afternoon, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Beata Casania who is an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and International Medicine at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine. She is currently the executive medical director of the Hillsborough County Health Department and responsible for developing clinical protocols, policies, procedures, and supervising the tuberculosis, HIV, and STD clinics. So uh, now I will allow Dr. Cassania to take things over and uh, provide her knowledge to us regarding uh, TB and HIV. Dr. Casanias. Thank you so much, Joanne, for such a warm introduction. Welcome, everyone. Today's objectives for our program is to describe the epidemiology of tuberculosis in the United States and in the world, uh, look at the differences between latent and active tuberculosis infection, uh, describe how the progression uh, between latent and active TB happens, what are the treatment options for latent active tuberculosis, what are the treatment plans, as well as what is the specific relationship which is so deadly between tuberculosis and HIV. Toward the end, we also will touch about treatment regimens and problems that we may run in as we treat patients co-infected with TB and HIV and what are the possible drug interactions uh, between both uh, diseases. Tuberculosis has been with us from the beginning of time. It has been said that uh, even in the old Egyptian times, uh, in our mummies, tuberculosis has been diagnosed. Uh, it was first coined as tuberculosis by Robert Koch in 1882. 
We actually celebrate the tuberculosis day, if you guys are aware, on March 24th, not to, to celebrate the disease, but more as use it as an opportunity uh, for us to educate our public and our providers uh, what, we, what needs to be done to diagnose it, how to treat it promptly. So for tuberculosis in United States, as you can see, uh, positive news that the total number of cases in tuberculosis, as you can see on the graph, has been decreasing. But what is worrisome is that we are reaching a plateau, meaning that the exact total number of cases are decreasing, but the rate of decrease has been slowing down. So with the current uh, resources that we have, we are reaching a plateau at how much we can diagnose, how much we can treat. So we definitely new, new, need new diagnostic features and maybe a better medications, which we'll touch upon as well, uh, to really decrease the cases uh, that we currently have. So what contributes to the increase in the TB morbidity? The HIV epidemic is definitely something which brought tuberculosis back in the picture and increased the number of total cases of tuberculosis. Uh, the increased immigration from countries of high prevalence of TB increased our numbers. And also transmission of tuberculosis in congregate setting. What do I mean by congregate setting? Uh, jails, uh, military bases, uh, even college dorms, anywhere that there is a high concentration of people which are together for a prolonged period of time. Uh, do you guys know what is the way, uh, what is the average number of hours that somebody needs to be diagnosed, needs to be exposed to somebody with tuberculosis to acquire tuberculosis? It's about eight hours. So yes, there are the extreme cases where somebody can be coughed on once and get tuberculosis, and extreme cases where someone can live with someone with tuberculosis and not acquire it. But on average, you need about eight hours of cumulative exposure to someone with tuberculosis in order to acquire the disease. And of course, our deterioration of our healthcare infrastructure uh, in certain settings, lack of directly observed therapy also contributes uh, to our um, TB morbidity and uh, mortality. Uh, these were the rates of tuberculosis in 1998. As you can see, Florida is one of the leading states where we are above the national average. And in comparison, in 2013, you can see that we are still in one of those <laughs> leading states uh, for tuberculosis. You will see that the data presented here, this is 2015, and our data is still from 2013. The reason for that is because tuberculosis takes a while to treat. The minimum treatment is four months, average treatment is six months. In many cases, the treatment is prolonged to nine, 12, or 18 months. Therefore, our data, which you will be seeing in, in today's presentation, it's about two years behind because that's how long it takes for our cases to be closed and fully treated after diagnosis. Tuberculosis is not a disease of the weak, the meekly, the elderly, or the young. As you can see, majority, up to 62% of cases, happen in patients in a prime of their age. 25 to 64. So these are healthy people, not necessarily with any comorbid conditions, at the prime of their age. In United States, as you can see, this is the cross-section of the population that we diagnose TB, so about 32% Asian descent, 29% uh, in our Latino population, 22% uh, in our African American population, maybe 15 in Caucasian, and minority, about 1% in American Indian, Alaskan Native, and about 1% in other. Something interesting happened in 2001. Up to 2001, majority of our cases uh, were diagnosed in patients which were U.S. native born. Uh, since 2001, majority of our cases diagnosed are in patients coming uh, from foreign countries who are born abroad. So this is an interesting case, trend that continues until today since 2001. 
What are the countries of birth in the United States for patients who, which are diagnosed who are foreign born? Uh, about 20% of our patients are coming from Mexico, 13% uh, from the Philippines, uh, India, Vietnam, 7 and 8% respectively, China, 6%, Guatemala and Haiti, 3% each, and about 40% is conglomerate from other uh, countries. As you can see, interestingly enough, not too many patients that, that we have representing uh, coming from Cuba, and we have quite a few refugees in our state, not too many patients diagnosed uh, from our patient neighbors in Canada. So I guess that speaks for maybe uh, good preventive medicine or preventive practices in those countries. Multidrug resistant tuberculosis has a very strict definition. Uh, it's a resistance to INH, isoniazid, and rifampin, which are the two first-line medications used for treatment of tuberculosis in combination with, I, with pirazenamide and etambutol. So definition of multidrug resistant tuberculosis is resistance to those two first-line medications, isoniazid and rifampin. As you can see, in 1993, we have quite a high rate of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. We had a small increase in 2002, and then again in 2011. Uh, we have less cases in 2012, and again, small increase in 2013. So it has been on a steady decline with year-to-year -year, uh, variations. How do we, do, do we diagnose tuberculosis? Uh, you probably all are familiar with our TST, tuberculin skin test, or a PPD test. Uh, this test has been with us for over hundreds of years, and we're still using it because it's quite useful. It has about 80% accuracy, which means that 20% of the time, unfortunately, we get the opposite result. So in patients which should have been negative, the test is positive. In patients which it should be positive, it's negative. So 20% of the time, uh, you get a result uh, which is not accurate. It's important to notice that when you measure the results after placing uh, the PPD or TST, 48 or 72 hours after the initial placement, that you measure the induration, the raised area, not the erythema or the redness around the test. And you've probably all seen the magic numbers of uh, which, uh, at which millimeter uh, number who is at risk and at what number the test is considered positive. So five millimeters is positive for someone who is immunosuppressed, like with HIV infection, somebody who has all tuberculosis lesions and evidence of all tuberculosis on their chest X-ray, or someone who has been a close contact recently to someone diagnosed with active infectious case of TB. As healthcare providers, we fall into the category of 10 millimeters. Uh, we are under the medical risk factors. Also, patients coming from uh, areas of high tuberculosis prevalence, so that's Latin America, Africa, and Asia, where the prevalence is more than 1%. 10 millimeters is considered positive. And also patients with uh, end-stage renal disease, intravenous drug use, also call, uh, fall into that category. Uh, patients with uh, no medical risk factors and no known exposure to TB, also from low prevalence areas, if the PPD or TST is 15 millimeters, at that time the test is considered positive. We also have another way of testing for latent or sleeping tuberculosis, if you will, in addition to that TST test, uh, the interferon gamma release assays. Uh, there are several of them on the market. The most popular ones are the quantiferon TB gold and the TB gold in tube and the T-SPAT TB test. Uh, these tests are blood tests which measure the patient's immune response to tuberculosis via production of interferon gamma in response to two very highly immunogenic antigens, the ESAT-6 and the CFP-10. Uh, the advantage of this test is that unlike the PPD or TST test, the patient does not 
uh, has have to come back again for the reading because with the PPD you place the test and the patient needs to come back within 48 to 72 hours for the reading. This test could be done in one day. It's the blood test. But the negative part of it is that it has to be processed and sent out within 8 to 16 hours. Again, this test is not 100% because it picks up a mycobacteria which are present in the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, so which includes, in addition to tuberculosis, it includes also mycobacterium kensei and other mycobacteria. So if the patient is infected, for example, with mycobacterium kensei, this test will be positive. The advantage of this test over the PPD or TST test, besides the fact that it only requires one patient visit, is the fact that it distinguishes uh, if a positive PPD in a patient is coming from their BCG vaccine. Because that's a question which quite often arises if the many patients who are foreign born and got the BCG vaccine as children, and then they are tested with a PPD, uh, they will believe that their positive PPD test is the reaction to their vaccine and not a uh, proof of their exposure to tuberculosis. Uh, the IGRA interferon gamma release assay actually distinguishes that uh, reaction because it does not pick up the mycobacterium bovis, which is in the BCG vaccine. So in someone who has a positive PPD claiming that their positive PPD is positive from their BCG vaccine, if we do the interferon test, if the reaction is coming from the BCG vaccine, the interferon test will be negative. If it's coming from tuberculosis exposure, the interferon, the IGRA test, will be positive. So sometimes the test is useful, especially in my personal practice, sometimes is to convince physicians whose positive PPD uh, are from tuberculosis to convince them that this is not from their BCG vaccine, but their result is truly coming from tuberculosis exposure and they do need uh, preventive therapy. Treatment for latent uh, inactive or sleeping tuberculosis, first-line treatment is isoniazid uh, daily for nine months. Another option is combination pill of INH, isoniazid with rifapentine for 12 doses weekly as directly observed therapy but it's only for patients who are HIV negative or patients who are HIV but not receiving HIV therapy, heart therapy, because of the drug interactions. Uh, third line therapy would be isoniazid twice weekly via directly observed therapy for nine months. And in instances where patients are having uh, reactions, uh, skin reaction, rashes, elevated liver function test to, uh, to isoniazid, uh, the fourth line therapy is rifampin, which is used daily for four months. So this again is treatment for latent or inactive tuberculosis. In about five to ten percent of patients, uh, within the first two years after exposure, uh, they have about five to ten percent risk of developing active disease after requiring the latent infection. Therefore, uh, the treatment for latent preventive tuberculosis is recommended within the first two years of exposure, again, to prevent them from progression to active disease because of the high risk of 5 to 10 percent. For HIV positive patients, the risk is much higher. It's about 10 percent per year. Therefore, HIV positive patients uh, are treated for latent tuberculosis regardless of their time of exposure because their risk is not only during the first two years, but it's ongoing and about 10% per year. What are the general features of tuberculosis? What makes tuberculosis so deadly is because it's so insidious. There is really not a one symptom that you can have but if you have it, you know for sure you have tuberculosis. We all hear about patients having hemoptysis. That's quite uh, pathognomonic for TB, but unfortunately only about 10 to 20 percent of patients present with hemoptysis. Usually patients uh, complain of very 
Non-specific symptoms such as fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, irritability, may have night sweats, low-grade fevers, some vague digestive disturbances, recurrent headaches. Uh, they may or may not have a cough. It may or may not be productive. Uh, again, thermoptysis in minority of patients. So as you can see, if this is something that is very chronic, the patients may just learn to live with it. Uh, they may be slowly losing weight and not realize that they actually have an infection uh, that they are living with, which is slowly uh, progressing. And many of those patients, especially with pulmonary symptoms, will be treated in outpatient settings with pneumonia. As you know, sometimes one of the common drugs used for treatment for outpatient pneumonia is Levaquin or Avalox, which are fluoroquinolones. And these medications are second-line therapy for tuberculosis. So these patients will get better while on treatment, because this is a second-line monotherapy for TB. But when they stop the therapy, they will uh, get sick again. So if you see patients in your offices which have uh, recurrent pneumonias, which do get better with antibiotics, please think of tuberculosis, uh, especially if they were treated with uh, fluoroquinolone. Uh, severe pulmonary TB, most ex infectious cases will have extensive cavities, the smears will be positive. At that uh, point, they will have a very high bacillary load, high mortality, up to 75% without treatment. These patients will be very infectious, up to 50% of their close contacts. And again, contacts uh, will be infected in majority of the cases, and evolution at that uh, time will be quite high in progression of the disease. So what is a TB treatment for active tuberculosis? For someone who is symptomatic, has tuberculosis in their lungs or in other body organ system. By the way, a majority of tuberculosis in HIV positive patients is extrapulmonary. It's not in their lungs, so therefore it's even more difficult to diagnose. The number one site uh, of extrapulmonary TB is the lymphatic system. So therefore, anybody with, especially HIV positive, with lymphadenopathy, biopsy is indicated for the diagnosis of TB because in 60% of the cases, uh, their lungs will be clear and they will have active extrapulmonary and even disseminated TB. So the medications for active tuberculosis, uh, we start in areas where we have more than 4% uh, resistance to, t to uh, INH rimfampin, which Hillsborough County in Florida falls in that category, we will start with four drugs uh, in all patients. The four drugs are INH, rifampin, pirazinamide, and etambutol. Uh, sometimes if we cannot use etambutol or pirazinamide, streptomycin, aminoglycoside injectable, may be used until sensitivities return. Usually the cultures take up to eight weeks to grow, so those patients will be on four drugs during the first eight weeks of treatment. When the sensitivities come back, uh, most of the time we'll be able to, if a patient is pan-sensitive, we are able to DC the etambutol or streptomycin, and especially after two months of therapy, we are able to DC the pyrazinamide and continue for remaining four months of treatment with isoniazide and rifampin to complete a total of six months of therapy. In many cases, the treatment length will be prolonged. For example, if the patient's cultures are positive, not smears, cultures are positive at two months of treatment, the therapy needs to be prolonged to minimum of four months after culture conversion to negative. If the patient's chest x-ray continues to improve, the patient's therapy is prolonged until chest x-ray resolution or stability. If we cannot use pyrazinamide during the first eight weeks of therapy, the induction phase, the treatment automatically is prolonged to nine months. If we cannot use rifampin, either for side effects from the medications, liver function test elevations, skin reactions, rashes, intractable vomiting, and we cannot use rifampin, the treatment is automatically prolonged to 18 months if we cannot use rifampin during the first eight weeks of the induction.
phase. So as you can see, there are many instances where the therapy is prolonged from 6 months to 9, 12, 18, even 24 months of therapy. Uh, in HIV-positive patients, the length of treatment is the same as for HIV-negative patients. You can use, after the induction phase, treatment twice a week or three times a week for HIV therapy, so it does not have to be daily. There are a few instances where it has to be daily, for example, on patients which are on anti-seizure medications, on patients which are on Coumadin, or on patients with the CD4 count is very low, less than 100. Uh, daily therapy is advocated because of the efficacy and also because of the drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And again, we would monitor patients' adherence, toxicity. Active therapy in the state of Florida is as directly observed therapy, which means that every dose that the patient takes is physically directly observed by a healthcare worker, either in the clinic or in the field. Resistance, as you would imagine, the highest resistance we will see in a community is for INH because this is the medication which is used for uh, preventive and latent tuberculosis, followed by aminoglycoside streptomycin at 6.5%, rifampin much less at 1.8%, and tabutol 1%. All four drugs are uh, about 0.2% resistance. So for someone who is pan-sensitive, uh, there is more than 95% chance of cure. In the state of Florida, really 99, 100% chance of cure. For patients who are resistant to INH, uh, about 90% chance of cure. Resistant to rifampin, about 70% of cure. For multi-drug resistant tuberculosis with INH and rifampin resistance, about 50% chance of cure. And again, before chemotherapy, 15% chance of cure. So what do I mean by that? Is that if for someone who has a good immune system, it's not immunosuppressed, they may get tuberculosis and they may get better about 50% of the time and get cured without treatment. So these are the patients that, you know, we get chest x-ray in our hospital or outpatient settings and we have this incidental findings of granulomas. We ask the patient, have they ever had tuberculosis? Have they ever been treated tuberculosis? And they say no, which means they probably had tuberculosis. They did not know about it and they got better by themselves. So multidrug resistant tuberculosis, HIV itself is not a risk factor, but what contributes to the resistance is poor adherence practices. So these are in areas where they do not have resources for directly observed therapy, where there are poor prescription practices, uh, where the patients are maybe given just uh, scripts and they run out of their medications or there is not continuity of treatment. And especially in foreign-born individuals, if they received therapy abroad, sometimes the drug quality is not sufficient. Uh, for example, in India, it's been estimated that up to 20% of their medications in their pharmacies are counterfeited. So even if a patient has documentation and they completed their whole therapy, they still may be inadequately treated, therefore developing multidrug resistance. So again, have a high index of suspicion if every treatment a schedule fails with proper adherence or if you have sensitivities uh, indicative of resistance, therefore the treatment needs to be adjusted. Here I want to move on to tuberculosis and HIV since tuberculosis is the number one killer of our HIV patients. Uh, it's almost impossible to talk about TB and not HIV and vice versa. This is one of our cards uh, that will make available for you even in paper form or for downloading uh, with all the treatment uh, guidelines for tuberculosis in HIV and AIDS and it has been updated last month. So who is at highest risk of TB disease? Uh, TB seems to affect the patients uh, the same as with HIV. So patients who are HIV infected, patients who are recently infected are at high risk. Patients with other medical conditions such as diabetes, cancer, immunosuppression from rheumatoid arthritis, high doses of steroids for their COPD, or even end-stage renal disease alone is a risk factor. Patients who are severely malnourished, someone who is 10% below their ideal body weight, 
that alone is an independent risk factor for progression from latent tuberculosis to active disease. Uh, patients who are active injection uh, illicit drug users and again patients with history of inadequately treated TB infections from before. So TB and HIV historically have affected similar populations. Glob globally, TB is the number two leading cause of death from infectious causes. That's number one killer in HIV positive patients. And TB and HIV, they have a very unique relationship. They independently of each other accelerate the progression of each other. About 2 billion individuals have been affected worldwide. It's been estimated that 33 million HIV-infected individuals worldwide are infected, and one-third of them are co-infected with TB. And the numbers vary. Uh, about 68% in sub-Saharan Africa, about 22% to Southeast Asia, and again 20% in India. And again, when you look at different statistics, also be aware uh, in certain countries, in certain regions, uh, not uh, the reporting uh, strategies and the reporting guidelines may be different. So in certain regions, it may not be a reportable disease, therefore the numbers may not always be accurate and reflecting the true percentages of infections. As you can see, uh, TB and HIV go hand in hand as the decrease as we decrease the incidence of HIV, the incidence of tuberculosis decreases as well. And these are the numbers between 1993 to 2013, so over a span of 20 years. What is the lifetime risk? We mentioned before it's about, uh, for HIV negative persons, 5% within the first two years and the 5% remainder of their lives, while for HIV positive patients, again, the risk is ongoing, and it's about 8 to 10 percent per year. Uh, there are two mechanisms of how tuberculosis uh, becomes active, either through reactivation or reinfection. And again, we mention uh, the unique relationship between TB and HIV. We'll also mention immune reconstitution syndrome of tuberculosis while on HIV therapy. So there are quite well described pathways how tuberculosis induces the progression of HIV, uh, meaning if somebody is on HIV therapy and they are immunosuppressed and they acquire tuberculosis, their tuberculosis actually will stimulate their HIV to progress and replicate, and vice versa. Uh, HIV will wake up a sleeping a latent tuberculosis and facilitate, facilitate it to become active happens by inducing the replication of HIV in the cells of the monocyte lineage in acutely infected macrophages and also activating the transcriptionally latent HIV in the alveolar macrophages or monocytes and recruiting them to the sites of the TB infection. So this is a really quite a deadly combination. Uh, there are quite well described pathways how this happens, how tuberculosis induces the tumor necrosis factor alpha accelerating the HIV replication, uh, several pathways uh, described as the nuclear factor kappa beta, P38 MAP kinase by high levels of non-inhibitory beta chemokine, MCP1, and low levels of inhibitory beta chemokines, MIP1 alpha, MIP1 beta, and Verantis. And I have a references at the end for you if you are interested in more detail. So for TB, HIV, and later TB infection, uh, for everyone who is HIV positive, it's recommended to performing uh, TST, skin test, or IGRA before initiation HIV therapy. It's recommended that if the test is negative and patient CD4 count is less than 200 at the time of testing, to repeat the TB test after CD4 count, count increases to above 200 on HIV therapy because you might have gotten a false negative because their immune system was uh, not uh, stimulated enough and too low to give you a positive reaction. Positive test results indicate latent infection. Uh, for all patients with positive either IGRA or uh, TST test, you need to rule out active disease with symptom screening and a chest x-ray 
before placing patient on latent therapy because otherwise you may be inadvertently treating uh, active TB case with monotherapy of INH. Of note, rifapentin should not be used in patients on ART uh, because of the drug to drug interaction unless the patient is uh, enrolled in a clinical trial. Tr recommendations for latent therapy in HIV infected patients is for INH for nine months. And if they are not on HIV or have therapy, a weekly INH or rifapentin for 12 doses of directly observed therapy uh, is recommended as well. For patients who are co-infected, uh, the TB treatment should be initiated immediately. If they are already on HIV therapy, you will add the TB therapy on top of the HIV therapy. Uh, if they are not on HIV therapy, you would initiate TB therapy first and then subsequently add the ART HIV therapy. Low CD4 counts are definitely a higher risk factor for mortality, and you can see the immune reconstitution syndrome more often uh, if, with patients with low CD4 count where the ART therapy is initiated early, but it's not associated, importantly, it's not associated with increased mortality. So for co-infections, you use the standard short course regimen. Again, rifampin, rifabutin-based regimens should be given at least three, weeks, three times per week in patients with CD4 count less than 100, if not daily. And again, rifapentin is not recommended because of the drug-to-dog -drug reinteractions on patients who are on ART therapy. Patients, just like I mentioned before, who are not on HIV therapy, you immediately initiate TB treatment as soon as possible. If the CD4 count is low, less than 50, you start the HIV therapy within two weeks of starting TB treatment. If the CD4 count is above 50 and they have severe clinical disease, you start within two to four weeks. If the CD4 count is above 50 and you have clinical disease which is not severe, you can delay starting the HIV therapy beyond two to four weeks, but do not wait more than eight to 12 weeks. If CD4 counts above 500, uh, the recommendations are softer, but again, uh, you will try to start the therapy within eight to 12 weeks of uh, initiating TB therapy. For pregnant women, you start the ART therapy as soon as possible. Uh, you have to watch out for inflammatory response, which may be present more often, such as meningitis, pericarditis, or even respiratory failure. The same goes for multidrug resistant TB or extremely drug resistant TB. You will start the HIV therapy, ART therapy within two to four weeks of initiation of TB therapy. If the patients are already on HIV treatment, you continue ART and you evaluate the ART therapy for interactions with uh, tuberculosis medications and at times you may need to make drug to drug modifications. So I have a few slides as a reference point for you, not something that I necessarily need you to memorize, but just to be aware that it exists. And anytime you are starting patients on either TB therapy or HIV therapy, please make sure that there are no drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And major rules for protease inhibitors and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors are rifampin, for example, may only be used with efavirenz, nevirapine, or full-dose ritonavir. It may not be used with ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitors. Uh, rifabutin is recommended with nevirapine and other protease inhibitors. And again, look out for dose adjustments. For maraviroc, it requires dosage increase when used with rifampin. For raltegravir, requires dosage increase also when used with rifampin. And here are a few slides that I just wanted you to have as your reference point, just to look at what are the drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Sometimes you have to adjust the HIV therapy. Sometimes you have to adjust the TB therapy. So these are for the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and protease inhibitors. We try to stay away, uh, away from using protease inhibitors when rifampin is used. Uh, this is, again, drug interactions through integrase trend transfer inhibitors as well as CCR5 inhibitors. As you can see, Maraviroc, uh, it's a potent CYP3A inhibitor, 
So the dose has to be either increased or decreased depending what you are combining it with. Again, with rifabutin, there are also drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And for efavirenzine, that's the one of the NNRTI where the standard dose of efavirenzine can be used, but you have to adjust the rifabutin dose. Etravirin, nevirepin, aeropavirin, again, this is something that I do not expect you to memorize, but be aware that it exists. Uh, use it as your reference point uh, to uh, use when you're starting patients on therapy. Again, drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions with protease inhibitors and unboosted protease inhibitors as well for your reference. Rifabutin with integrase inhibitors, again with CCR5 inhibitors, again for your reference where dosage adjustments are needed or not necessary and which are do not combine under no circumstances uh, combinations. So IRIS, immune reconstitution syndrome. Uh, this is basically worsening of clinical status while somebody is on treatment for tuberculosis. So immune reconstitution syndrome. When someone is not on treatment, they may be infected with many uh, opportunistic infections, but if they are not aware, if their immune system is low, uh, they could be living with those infections and not know they have them. Once you start them on HIV therapy, the fight begins, the inflammation starts, and they may be experiencing symptoms. The same thing happens when you start TB therapy. The same thing happens when you start TB and HIV therapy within two weeks apart. So you may have patients uh, with, again, this inflammatory response, especially patients with lower CD4 counts less than 50, and it happens usually less than 30 days after starting the TB therapy, uh, infrequently associated with mortality. In those patients, you would continue treatment for TB and for HIV, you would not stop therapy for liver infection. Mild to moderate symptoms, you would treat with non-steroidals, anti-inflammatory medications. For severe cases, patients may have to be admitted to the hospital to receive intravenous corticosteroids, but again, you will not withhold neither tuberculosis nor HIV therapy. Okay? So as a quick <coughs> summary, for patients who are treated uh, with HIV, who are treated for tuberculosis, do you need to add higher number of drugs? The answer is no. The treatment for tuberculosis in HIV negative and in HIV positive patients is the same, the same number of drugs. Do you need to prolong duration of therapy? No. The length of treatment of tuberculosis in HIV positive patients is the same. You may have to prolong therapy because of other factors, but HIV in itself does not warrant prolongation of therapy as per guidelines. Can antiretroviral therapy be used together with antituberculous therapy? Yes. The key issue is you would not start both therapies at the same time. They have to be minimum two weeks apart and TB therapy first, HIV, ART therapy second. Is there increased incidence of adverse side effects? No, the adverse effects in HIV positive patients when treated for tuberculosis are the same. There may be drug to drug interactions, but the in increase, there is no increase of adverse side effects just because they have HIV. So they're still going to have problems maybe with their eyes, with tambutol, with gout, on perizenamide with liver function tests or rashes with INH or rifampin. So the incidence of side effects is the same in HIV positive patients. Is there increased incidence of multidrug resistant TB in HIV positive patients? No, multidrug resistance uh, stems from poor drug qualities, intermittent therapies, uh, poor prescription practices. It's not associated, at least at this time, with uh, immunosuppression as a risk factor for developing resistance. Should latent tuberculosis be treated in HIV-positive patients? Yes, regardless of the time of exposure to tuberculosis, uh, because the risk is ongoing and it's 10%, 
yearly. So regardless when they were exposed to tuberculosis, if you diagnose somebody with either positive uh, IGRA or positive uh, TST, please treat them regardless of their time of exposure because their risk is 10% and it's ongoing. Here are the answers to the questions we just discussed. And here are my references. And I will leave a forum open for questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasanya. So the first question, um, Dr. Kasanya, says, how do we handle patients that have received the BCG vaccine? Can you just um, review that again for everyone? Uh, it seems to be a common question that people have as far as the history of the BCG vaccine and what that means in terms of their PPD and or uh, IGRA testing. Excellent question. Thank you so much, Joanne. So in United States, we pretty much ignore the BCG vaccine. Why is that? The BCG vaccine is usually given uh, when you are a child, and it gives you positive TST about five to seven years up after administration, which means if somebody had their BCG vaccine when they were a baby, and now they are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, their positive PPD is not coming from their BCG vaccine because that reaction would only be positive for about five to seven years after vaccination. Unless they were vaccinated, you know, a couple of years ago, in those instances, we would use the IGRA test, which would distinguish it. But for all intents and purposes, majority of our patients were vaccinated as children. And if they have a positive TST result, that's coming from that exposure to tuberculosis and not the BCG vaccine. Thank you so much. And on the same lines of, uh, you know, testing patients for possible latent TB infection, how do you recommend that folks handle the issue of indeterminate quantiferon TB gold test results? Yes, thank you so much for bringing this up. So this is a question which arises quite often. What do we do with this indeterminate result? This was supposed to be the test which should help us with all these, you know, millimeters of PPDs, and now we are getting indeterminate, and we still don't know. Do we treat? We don't treat. What do we do? So first thing I would recommend, please talk to your lab and ask them what do they mean by indeterminate. Different labs have different cutoff numbers, and sometimes indeterminate means that the test was so positive that it flooded the reagent. That's why it's indeterminate. So it, it helps to know what do they mean by indeterminate, that it's really overly, overtly positive. And number two, if you are testing someone who is already immunosuppressed, either profound HIV or they are on high doses of steroids because of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or they are about to receive uh, anti-TNF drugs, biologics, which are going to be even more immunosuppressed, in those questions it's recommended to do, instead of the quantiferon, to do the T-SPAT test, because that test actually counts a specific number of T cells. So it seems to be more accurate in patients who do not have enough immune system sometimes for the quantiferon test to be positive. And lastly, of course, you look at the test in a context of a patient. It's just a piece of a puzzle. So why were you testing the patient in the first place? What are the risk factors? What is their history? Where are they coming from? Why they are being tested? What is their incoming risk? Are they about to be transplanted with a solid organ? And they are going to be on very heavy duty immunosuppression the rest of your life, rest of their life. That will determine how would you interpret the indeterminate test basically in the context of the patient and every, each given patient situation. Thank you. And uh, what about patients that have had a prior positive PPD or IGRA or uh, uh, T-SPOT? What do you recommend for routine monitoring of these patients for uh, development of tuberculosis? 
Thank you so much. Excellent question again. So our PPD, our IGRA tests are only one-time tests. Unfortunately, once they are turned positive, uh, many insta instances, they will stay positive for life and we lose our screening test. So for patients who have been positive in the past, have been treated for tuberculosis, we cannot rely on those screening tests anymore. Therefore, would be either uh, for patients which we have a very high index of suspicion and they are symptomatic, we would be looking for active disease for, with chest x-ray, but for patients without symptoms, we would screen them with very good history and physical exam. So only symptomatic screening. You would not be repeating the IGRA, you would not be repeating the PPD, and again, you would not be doing chest x-rays on those patients on a regular basis unless they're becoming symptomatic. So again, all those screening tests are one-time tests. Once they become positive, we lose them for the future diagnostic uh, purposes. Thank you so much. So um, can you review again about the timing of the initiation of antiretroviral versus the timing of the initiation of TB therapy? Yes. So for patients who are already on HIV therapy, we can safely add tuberculosis therapy as soon as possible. We have to look again for possible drug-to-drug -drug interactions and adjust either the TB or HIV therapy, but we safely add as soon as possible the TB therapy. The issue comes up is the patient diagnosed with tuberculosis and they are not on HIV therapy. At that time, you start the TB therapy first, and depending on their CD4 count, as you can see on this slide, and the severity of their disease, you determine how soon you add the HIV therapy or ART therapy on top of the TB therapy. The reason you would space out the treatment and you would not start both TB and HIV therapy at the same time, first of all, is because of the drug-to-drug -drug interactions and the side effects the patient would have with two sets and new medications being started at the same time. And as you know, majority of symptoms from either HIV and TB therapy actually gets better after two weeks of treatment. Number two reason, that the patient would be possibly undergoing immune reconstitution syndrome, and you do not want them to reconstitute from both infections at the same time. So you try to space out the treatment by minimum two weeks to, again, not to uh, synergistically add the side effects from both sets of medications, and also to make sure that if they under develop immune reconstitution syndrome from each disease, both of those uh, inflama inflammatory responses are not happening superimposed on each other, because sometimes that's what requires the patients to be admitted and receive intravenous corticosteroids and be hospitalized. Thank you. And another question is, do you do uh, TST yearly for HIV patients? For all HIV patients, uh, do you check for latent tuberculosis infection on a yearly basis with TST or IGRA? or do you only test uh, patients that are at risk? Our, our recommend, recommendations are to test patients yearly. Uh, in many cases, we assume our HIV-positive patients are at higher risk than the general population because of this 10% yearly increased risk if they are infected with latent tuberculosis with the progression to active disease. Their four recommendations are for screening HIV-positive patients on a yearly basis because of that increased ongoing risk if they get infected. And I think that uh, this is a controversial issue because I think that there's um, some areas where uh, if they're not deeming their patients to be at high risk for um, right. exposure, to tuberculosis, they're not necessarily testing them yearly, but I know a lot of places are still, like you said, um, testing them yearly because of the risk in their patient population. 
I mean, at least I would imagine you would be if your institution is not recommending yearly testing, at least you would be symptomatically screening them every year, if not more often, especially if they are at risk. So I wanted to just touch base uh, regarding the drug interaction section. Uh, the uh, drug interactions were put uh, on here by Dr. Kasanias, and uh, I'm actually a clinical pharmacist with the Florida Caribbean AETC, so uh, drug interaction questions come to uh, me a lot. And we put this information here, and it's also on the TB pocket card. That's available on our website, and it's also in the download handout section. And we would never expect that everybody can remember all of these drug interactions. Just in general, there are a lot more drug interactions with rifampin because it is a more potent inducer of drug metabolism. So when you see the drug interaction information, you'll see that there are a lot more regimen options in terms of antiretrovirals when you're using rifabutin versus rifampin. So a lot of times you might see patients on rifabutin more frequently. Uh, I've seen, I don't know if you've seen that a lot more and you've used that a lot more, Dr. Kasanias. Uh, yes, we actually automatically, for anyone that is HIV infected, we anticipate them being on HIV therapy, we automatically uh, place the patient on rifabutin uh, instead of rifampin as part of a ripe. Yeah, because the, the antiretroviral regimen options are much, much more limited with rifampin, but there are some options. So it's something you really need to uh, look up each and every time. And the other thing to remember is they're very, the drug interactions can be very complex, and there can be interactions uh, both affecting the antiretroviral drug levels as well as the rifamycin drug levels. And a lot of times, uh, if the interactions are extremely complex, you may want to consider that you need to do therapeutic drug monitoring of the TB, the anti-TB drugs like the rifamycins and or the antiretrovirals. And we have information on that pocket card about where you can get that uh, testing done. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center's mission is to ensure that physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, pharmacists, case managers, and other healthcare professionals in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands receive state-of-the-art information, training, and consultation on the prevention, chronic disease management, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Funding is provided by the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides a variety of HIV AIDS education, training, consultation, and resources. Visit our website, www.fcaetc.org, to learn more. Stay in touch with us by joining our mailing and email list. You will receive notices about upcoming educational opportunities, as well as new and updated HIV AIDS resources. You may also sign up to receive our HIV CareLink newsletter. Visit our website, fcaetc.org, and click on Join Our Mailing and Email List at the top of the homepage. Be sure to also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Florida Caribbean AETC provides consultation services to clinicians in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you have questions related to the content of this program or would like consultation on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS and related conditions, we would love to hear from you. We also offer consultation on the interpretation of resistance test results. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash consultation to ask your question today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides pocket size treatment guideline resources that detail the federally approved HIV AIDS medical practice guidelines such as the adult antiretroviral therapy, hepatitis, pediatric antiretroviral therapy, adult opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, 
and pre-exposure prophylaxis, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, and occupational PEP. In addition, we have summarized common practices for the post-exposure prophylaxis in pediatrics adolescents. We have also developed resources that provide an overview for treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in HIV-infected patients and therapeutic agents for oral manifestations. Visit our website to download or request copies of these resources. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides web-based educational opportunities to increase the knowledge and skills of HIV healthcare providers. Live and on-demand options are available. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash education for more information. Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, Project ECHO, provides a web-based didactic presentation on a current HIV treatment issue based upon current Department of Health and Human Services and other accepted treatment guidelines. Project ECHO also provides an opportunity to discuss case presentations submitted by participants and an opportunity to network with both your peers and HIV experts. All members of care and treatment teams, including case managers, are welcome to participate. Information discussed is targeted at providers with basic or intermediate HIV AIDS treatment experience. Choose from four session types. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash echo to view upcoming sessions and to register. If you are located outside of our region, the Clinician Consultation Center provides consultation services via the phone numbers listed here. Or you may also visit www.nccc.ucsf.edu for more information. To locate the AETC in your region, visit www.aidsetc.org.